This is one of the most harrowing and gruesome true survival stories you may ever hear. It is also one of the most famous ghost stories in Texas state history. It all started back in August of 1833. A man by the name of Josiah Wilbarger would wake up in the homestead of Sarah and Reuben Hornsby. Josiah, who was 33 at the time, was staying at the Hornsby's with four companions, whose last names were Christian, Strother, Standifer, and Haney. He was staying there with these men because they were using the Hornsby's as a base of operations from which to launch local land surveys. So that morning, the five woke up, they had an early breakfast, they thanked their two hosts for their hospitality, and then they would mount up on their horses and leave to conduct the day's survey. After some time, they arrived at a location called Walnut Creek, which is just outside what is now modern-day Austin, Texas. And when they got to this location, the five men noticed that up on a ridge line, there was a lone Comanche warrior sitting on horseback, and he was watching them very intently. Now, up until this point, there had been no violent conflict between the Comanche and the white homesteaders in the area. So the men were not really concerned, and in fact, Will Barger would beckon towards this lone warrior to come down and meet them. But the warrior would not do that. Instead, he would beckon to them to come up and meet him, which the men would attempt to do. The five of them would go up towards him, but while they were still some distance away, the Comanche would turn his horse around and begin riding away from them. But beckoning to them over his shoulder to continue to follow him. And they would for a short time, but after several minutes they became very uneasy when they recognized that he was leading them towards a large column of smoke, which they could only assume was some sort of encampment where an unknown number of Indians were waiting for them with unknown intentions. Like maybe this is some sort of ambush. So the five stop, they convene, they have a little powwow, and they decide that they're going to stop following this lone warrior. Furthermore, they're not going to continue with the day's land survey. They're going to head back to the Hornsby's homestead just to be safe. So they turn their horses around, and they head back in that direction. Now, before they got back to the homestead, though, their horses became exhausted, and they needed a break. So they found a little grove next to a spring, and they dismounted and allowed their horses to graze. The five men grabbed their rifles, and they sat down and had a little lunch. Unbeknownst to them, that lone Comanche warrior had made his way back to that encampment where some 60 other Comanche warriors were waiting. And as soon as that one warrior had got back, the full 60 of them had set out in pursuit of this small party of five. They had tracked them down, found where they were at in this little grove, and the Comanches had left their horses hundreds of meters away so that the white men could not hear the horses coming, and they had spent quite some time now sneaking stealthily through the underbrush and through these trees to get within striking distance of Josiah and his party. So as the five unsuspecting men sat there eating lunch, out of nowhere, a hail of arrows and gunfire came raining down on this small party. Immediately, Strother is mortally wounded. He is not killed outright, but he's on the ground, he's incapacitated, and he is clearly dying. The other four men gain what cover they can behind some small skinny trees in this grove and immediately start returning fire. It's not too long after the gunfight begins, though, that Christian, now the second man to be wounded, is shot through the thigh and it shatters his femur and basically incapacitates him. He falls to the ground and he's screaming and crying for Josiah to help him. Josiah is not too far away behind another tree, and Josiah would come and help him. He leaves the cover of his tree, and he runs over to Christian. He grabs Christian, he props him up with his back against the tree, he finishes loading or priming Christian's rifle for him, 
and he hands it back to Christian in hopes that Christian will be able to have the wherewithal to continue this fight. At this point, Josiah receives his first wound, which is a, a gunshot through his thigh. And right after that, an arrow would go all the way through Josiah's calf on the same leg. This didn't really slow Josiah down, though. He ended up running back to the tree he was originally at, where he gets ready, he takes aim to fire at a Comanche, when yet another arrow, so a third wound, another arrow comes and strikes Josiah in the opposite thigh. So now, the two white men who are as of yet not wounded, that's um, Haney and Standifer, they begin to kind of assess this situation. So Strother is on the ground, clearly dying. At this point, Christian also appears to be dying. He's losing a lot of blood, and he has ceased fighting back, and he is now lying on the ground again. And now Josiah is wounded three times, and he's up ahead of them, and the Comanche warriors are now beginning to outflank them. They're beginning to encircle them. So Standifer and Haney decide that they have got to make a run for it. It's now basically two against 60. They know they can't win. So they run back and mount up on their horses and start to make a run for it. Josiah is yelling at them, pleading with them to please stay and help defend him and Christian. But as he kind of gets up to make his way towards them, he turns around to take aim at one final Comanche warrior. And as he does so, Standifer and Haney can see that Josiah is struck in the back of the neck with a musket ball, which goes all the way through his neck and blows out the front underneath of his chin. And immediately Josiah falls to the ground and they assume that he's killed outright. They are able to make an escape unscathed and they make it all the way back to the Hornsby's homestead where they report that their three companions have just been killed by these Comanches. Meanwhile, back at the site of the ambush, Josiah is not dead. He is lying on the ground and he is temporarily paralyzed. He can't even blink, but he's still very much conscious and very much alive lying there looking at his two companions who as of yet are also not dead they're they're still dying but they're not dead yet but now all three of them are incapable of fighting back and at this point the comanche warriors close in around them and josiah is forced to watch as his two companions get their throats cut to end their lives and then they are scalped as the Comanche warriors approach him, they must believe at this point that he is either already dead due to the severity of his neck wound, if nothing else. I mean, it's blown out his whole neck, basically. Or that he will surely die soon. So they do not cut his throat. They do, however, strip him totally naked with the exception of one blood-soaked sock. And they... One of them grabs him by the hair and grabs his knife and starts scraping it around Josiah's scalp. Now, Josiah would say that this actually didn't hurt him at all, whether that's because of adrenaline or because of his temporary paralysis, we will never know, but he said it didn't hurt. He said, though, that the noise of the knife scraping against his skull sounded like thunder. Now, after this Comanche warrior works the knife all the way around in a full, full circle, the warrior gives his hair one good solid tug and rips the entire top of Josiah's scalp off. And mercifully, at this point, Josiah would lose consciousness. Sometime later, towards the evening, Josiah would awaken. And he said that he was racked with thirst. So his first thought was to crawl slowly over to this little spring that they had been eating lunch next to. And he got a drink of water. 
he would then take off the sock, which was his only remaining particle of clothing, and he would soak it in this spring, and he would put it over his exposed skull as some kind of protection. He then crawled about 600 meters away. He was trying to make it back to the Hornsby's homestead, but he did not have anywhere near the strength to make it, you know, the full mile or more back to the Hornsby's. So after about 600 yards or meters, he collapses at the base of an oak tree. Further on into the night, he's kind of delirious. He's in and out of consciousness when he said that right in front of him appeared his sister, Margaret. Now, realistically, he knows that Margaret isn't really there because she's 700 miles away in Missouri. But he said that she appeared to him just as real as any normal person standing right in front of him. And she would say to him, she said, you know, I know you don't have enough strength to make it back, but hold on, help is coming. And he would beg her not to leave him, but she would turn around and walk out into the darkness towards the direction of the Hornsby's homestead. Now, back at the Hornsby's homestead, Sarah, who was sleeping in bed with her husband Reuben, would wake up suddenly in the middle of the night. And she would wake up Reuben and she would tell him she just had a dream where Josiah was sitting naked under a tree with a bloody sock on his head and he was scalped, but he was alive. And Reuben would kind of calm her down. He would remind her that the two men who had survived, who were still at their house, had told them that without a shadow of a doubt, the three men that they were with had been killed by these Indians. They were surrounded. They had watched them be shot to pieces. The three were definitely dead. And you're just having a bad dream. So Sarah would ultimately end up going back to sleep. But as soon as she fell asleep the second time, she had this dream again. Not only does she wake up Reuben at this time, but she went and she woke up the other two men who had survived. And they would assure her that, trust us, these three men are definitely dead. We watched it with our own eyes. And they would eventually, con they would eventually convince her to go back to bed for a second time. And at this point, it was around three in the morning. And when she fell asleep for the second time, she had for a third time the same exact dream where Josiah was sitting at the base of this oak tree, naked, scalped with a bloody sock on his head, but very much alive. And when she woke up this time, she was not taking no for an answer. She woke all the men up again. And she began cooking breakfast for them, telling them, if you are not cowards, you will go out to this specific place that I'm telling you to find him at, because he is sitting at the base of this tree, naked, with a sock on his head, scalped, but very much alive. And the men would eventually just capitulate and say, okay, we will go at first light. And they did. Now, when they arrived back where she was describing he was, they couldn't find it at first, but they did find the bodies of the other two men. And as they kind of looked around 600 yards away at the base of this oak tree, they see a bloody body and they rode up to it and they didn't even recognize Josiah at first. Josiah would actually have to tell them, he would say, Hey, it's me. It's Josiah. He was just so disfigured from the scalping, they, they just didn't even recognize him. But he was alive. And they put him on their one of their horses, and they rode him as fast as they could back to the Hornsby's homestead. And by the time they got there, Sarah was so convinced that he was alive the whole time, and that he would be found just exactly in the state that she described, that she had already made up a poultice medicine for his head 
And so as soon as they got back, she immediately began tending to him. She put this poultice over his, you know, his skull, his scalped head, and she tended to him for days and days and days until he was healthy enough to be put on a sled and brought back to his own property where his wife awaited him. Now, after a few years, he developed... So his skull was exposed from this point. The flesh never grew back, so it was just his bare skull. And he would eventually develop an infection in the bone, which would wear down the bone to the point where eventually Josiah's brain was exposed. And, you know, at this point... He, he, he lived, he survived uh, that infection, but his bare brain is now exposed. And <clears throat> his wife would make him these caps to protect his exposed brain. But 11 years after this incident, when Josiah was 44, he was going into his gin house when he would knock his head and his exposed brain on a low uh, door frame and just hitting his head on that door frame would end up killing him. Now, one of the crazier parts of this story, even crazier than I think Sarah's dream, which told the men where to find him and that he was still alive, is that a few months after the initial incident, Josiah received mail from Missouri. I mean, it took months from mail for, for mail to get from Missouri to Texas at the time over the frontier. But several months after the incident, he receives mail from Missouri telling him that his sister had died. Margaret had died. But as he looked at the date when she died, she had died the day before they were ambushed by these Comanche Indians. Now, obviously, we cannot confirm that he ever saw this apparition of Margaret. We do know for a historical fact that Margaret did die the day before and that he didn't find out till later. But we can never confirm that he actually did see Margaret. We can also never confirm that Sarah was being truthful when she woke up three times that night saying she had that dream. But both parties would swear to their dying day, both Sarah and Josiah would swear to their dying day that that was true. He had seen his sister. And Sarah would swear that she had had that dream three times in a row at three in the morning. And that's what, you know, saved his life. We'll never know that for sure. And, you know, that's the part of the story that we can't confirm. But if you have an open mind, I mean, anything is possible.